The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit of the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All right, we're in the doctrine of the rapture, and we're on Roman numeral 8. Doctrine of the rapture. All believers in Jesus Christ, from the moment of salvation onward, are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who revealed the gospel to us. It's the Holy Spirit that indwells us. And we have a command to be filled with the Spirit so that God the Holy Spirit can do his work effectively towards those who exhibit positive volition. And that is to lead us into truth. That is Jesus promised that the Spirit would come and would lead positive volition into the truth. But you have to do your part, and your part is as simple as being here, being in fellowship, and giving the information your undivided attention. Obviously, all of us start somewhere, and we grow in grace and in knowledge, as in any, any field and any subject that a person is new to or involved with, there is a learning curve, and the learning curve requires the uh, diligence of the hearer, the one being instructed. So this is your opportunity to decide today, right now, that you are going to fulfill this function, not only in person, but indeed by being in fellowship. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we know that there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. We are here because we have not chosen that path, that you and your grace have provided for us where we can assemble ourselves together and receive spiritual enlightenment with regard to this wonderful plan that we are involved in. Be with us in our study, in Christ's name, amen. With regard to the topic of the rapture, I have noticed that, at least from my perspective, that uh, there are more comments on the news stuff on my, where it's all this stuff, good, bad, and ugly, uh, MSN, uh, more discussions of the rapture as a topic, which I'd never seen before, I, I can recall, okay? and uh, that uh, there is an awareness out there, a growing awareness that of the topic, and because of the conditions in the world, uh, that it's imminent, very imminent. So anyway, our, our objective here is to break this down so you can understand the details and not just have a cursory or even a misunderstanding with regard to the topic of where you as a believer are soon going to find yourselves. So uh, here we have uh, some false views of the rapture, inevitably, inevitably, with regard to any topic in the Bible, there's going to be different views on the subject. The first is completely ludicrous, but there were Christians promoting this, not currently that I'm aware of, <laughs> Uh, uh, around the time of World War I and before, that the church would usher in the millennium. Really? This is mind-boggling. This is the post-millennial view that the church uh, has such an impact on the world that there's such a level of conversion. Uh, Christ comes back because the church has done this. Okay, skip that. That's absolute, utter nonsense. I don't know how people can look at the word of God and come up with such lunacy, but they do. The split rapture theory, uh, this one's easily debunked. This view was promoted by 
I guess, self-righteous types. I didn't do much studying of the Bible either. That only, only the good believers, uh, the adjusted believers are going to be taken. Well, what about all the ones that died before that were adjusted or weren't? So they have this goofy view and uh, that only the faithful will be taken, which is a misinterpretation uh, of First Thessalonians 5. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't... The topic in First Thessalonians 5 is, <clears throat> uh, here, here, by the way, is Paul writing to the Thessalonians, as I recall. He didn't spend all that long there, but in this time frame that he was with them, he brought them from ground zero, even below ground zero, brought them along spiritually so that they had an understanding of things. He says, uh, now as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. A thief who comes in the night obviously surprises uh, those that they rob from. They come, come under the cover of night. A lot of thieves operate at that when people can't see. Okay, what that means is that this is going to hit the human race at large right between the eyes. When the day of the Lord comes, the day of the Lord is technical for everything from the rapture to the great white throne judgment. That's all day of the Lord, and that includes the seven-year tribulation, the, the transition period into the millennium, all the way through the millennium and however long the Gog and Magog affair takes place and then the white throne judgment. And all that's the day of the Lord. And then we move into the eternal state which is called the day of God elsewhere. While they are saying, now I've had a issue with this verse since uh, I first taught it and had to change my notes with regard to this subject. Because it's, but who, is, who are the subjects here? Well, you say it's the world at large. It's those who, who he comes as a thief in the night. When they are saying peace and security or safety, of course, we've heard that uh, pushed around, uh, peace and security, which obviously neither of which the inhabitants of the world have had uh, in uh, my lifetime and certainly before, uh, they've talked about it a lot, uh, but they haven't, ha they haven't achieved it. Uh, in the last days, uh, we know that there will be, among other things, a proliferation of wars and rumors of war. That this, this will continue to continue uh, onward. So, uh, I, I'm not... 100% sure who the subjects are here in this verse. One, it could be the entire human race. But when, at what point after the rapture is the human race at large going to be in the peace and security mode? I don't know where they'd be. So what does it refer to? Here's a possibility. Here's the possibility. Rapture occurs. There is this, uh, uh, these announcements. There is the threat of war with Russia. Something might come along like the rider on the white horse and everyone will say, we're, we're going to skate free now from this. It's not going to happen. And therefore, the in individual. Remember that when this information was revealed to any author of Scripture, time has to elapse and there's other stuff that none of these people had the book of Revelation. It wouldn't come for, you know, another 40 years or 30 or something. So they didn't have the book of Revelation to reference. They didn't have this whole completed canon where you can work at all these pieces from the Old Testament to the New. They didn't even have the New Testament formed up completely. So 
It is possible that the peace and safety people will be the Americans who elect not to leave this country and follow divine instructions. Then destruction will come upon them suddenly. That would be, that would, that would be fulfilled in a nuclear attack, suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. And we know that the American contingent uh, that is left uh, here in America after we subtract the rapture crowd and the people who exit, it, exit out of here, uh, that they will be caught. But you brethren are not in darkness, that that day would overtake you like a thief. In other words, you're going, to, you're going to be apprised of things that need to be in place on the ground before that day can happen. That's, that's essential. Uh, for you are sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then, let us not sleep. This does not refer to dying. This is a different Greek verb. This refers to being out of it spiritually. When you are asleep, you are basically unaware of your surroundings unless you awaken. So sleep cuts you off from what's going on around. So let us not sleep as others do, other believers, but let us be alert and sober. For those who, do, for those who sleep, do their sleeping at night, typically. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night, typically. Exceptions exist, but that's the standard thing with regard to these things. Now, drunkenness means somebody is under the influence. So in this case, spiritual drunkenness is in view. They are under cosmic viewpoint of various kinds. That's to be drunk. And, and so the drunks are all over the place, so to speak the spiritual drunks. <clears throat> but since we are of the day, we're of the day of the Lord in a positive way. We're of the day, which of course is kicked off with the rapture. Let us be sober. We shouldn't be speculating. We shouldn't be getting all uh, sober. Sober means that you're in, in a sound mind. You're in a sound frame of mind when you're not under the influences. Having put on the breastplate of faith and love, that's our spiritual armor. We walk by faith. Love is our mantra with regard to dealing with others. And a helmet. A helmet, obviously, is a essential part of Roman gear and protects the most vital part of the anatomy, which is the head. They wear them in football and in Roman times, and even, so, so it's a head protect, it's to protect the head. And what this basically means is that you have a real good handle on and understanding of your salvation. You're not, you know, wondering if and, doubting and you're, you're secure because your faith is based on the verses and the doctrine, the, the larger doctrine of salvation. So you've got that, you've got that helmet on, securely in place. The helmet of salvation. It's called here the hope of salvation. Not that you're hoping to get it, but the hope that it brings to you with regard to your ultimate future. For God has not destined us for wrath, that does not refer to hell. Some places, wrath, now wrath as a word, refers to everything from eternal condemnation to divine discipline, to judgment on nations and people. And it's technical, it's another technical term for the tribulational period of the day of the Lord. It's the day of wrath against the nations. Again, this must be qualified for anyone who is listening to it. Everybody will get an opportunity to save their proverbial bacon by believing in Christ after the rapture, just like it is before. 
Everybody has the same opportunity. No one's left behind that would otherwise believe. God's plan is not, uh, does not have any of those uh, failures in it. I mean, when you look around and you see events occurring where people are dying like crazy, like in Ukraine, military, civilians, all of this, all this carnage that we're stupid enough to stick our big nose in. This is the trap God has set for the United States and our great arrogance that we think we can mess around over there, send billions of dollars in military equipment that the Russians will blow up. They are so far advanced, Mr. Arrogant American. They are so advanced. While we're running around doing all our stupid stuff, they're building a military arsenal both at the tactical level and at the uh, 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 um, intercontinental missile level, subs, launch pads, the rest. An American military guy broke it down. He says their, their stuff's so much better it isn't even funny. He's a retired Marine. He says their helicopters are state-of-the-art. Art. Their drones, their tanks, their mortars. A bunch of people, they set a bunch of tanks over there. They just wiped them out. It's a joke. Back in the day, we were going to have to play war games with Russia. We backed off. Their tanks versus ours. I don't know how they do that, uh, where it isn't actually, you know, but, but we wouldn't do it. So we've been, we've been involved in all this social evil, running around the world, doing all this stuff when we should have took care of our own business. We once were at the top dog. We are not now. We're just running on fumes. FYI. Because of the kind of leaders and the arrogance. And the, the New World Order crowd hasn't been able to rein Russia in nor will they. I never thought I'd be saying this about Russia because when I was on doctrine in the beginning, it was the brutal, corrupt Soviet Union, the Bolsheviks, who murdered Russian people all over the place. Well, that isn't the Russia of today. They banned all churches of every kind, put people in gulags, killed tens of millions of them while we sent aid over to them. Lend-lease, ever heard of it? What are we doing this for? We're supposed to be the freedom-loving people. And why would we support a dictatorship that's committing genocide against his people? More sins that we're going to be judged for. When I say we, I'm talking about the USA corporately. God has not destined us for wrath. We're not destined for the trib. Under the doctrine of divine decrees. The divine decrees of God exist from eternity past. He made decrees before there was anything, knowing the future. And he made a decree, knowing the church would come into existence, that we're not destined for wrath, but obtaining deliverance. That word right there, translated salvation, is not phase one salvation. It's the rapture, a synonym that I gave you earlier for those verses that deal with the, the word deliverance, salvation, slash salvation. This word can apply to any number of things. I was delivered from a sickness, a car wreck, people, deliverance, and then salvation, and then here the rapture through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us. And this refers to his spiritual death, gang. Who died for us, the three hours of darkness, where he bore the sins of the world. Who died for us, so that whether we are awake, this refutes in our point, point B, the split rapture theory. So that, 
whether we are awake, spiritually alert, on the alert, or asleep, we shall live together with him. That says that the good believers and the sleeping believers are both going to be taken. That only makes sense. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another, just as you also are doing. Uh, so the split rapture theory, the, there, then there was the mid-trib rapture. The church goes through one half of the trib. There's no evidence of it because in Revelation, once you get past chapter three and you start with chapters four and following, you have no reference to the church at all. Israel, the nations, etc. You have no mention of the church because it's not on earth. The true church of Jesus Christ made up of individual members who are believers. There'll be fake Christianity on the earth. There'll be a bunch of uh, uh, churches still on earth, but these people aren't born again believers. Some congregations are going to see missing members and, well, that, but they, they didn't go. Uh, and then, of course, there's that uh, RCC. It's not, a, it's not an old soda drink from the past. Royal Crown. <laughs> RCC, that's our abbreviation, Roman Catholic Church. It gets taken down by the Antichrist in Revelation 17. I wonder how many evangelicals are teaching that. Just again, all this stuff that's omitted. They teach some good stuff, but it's the stuff they omit and the stuff they mess up. We're trying not, we're not to try, we're trying not to be on the messing things up. If I have to correct something, I will. The next time the church is mentioned is a scene Clear over in Revelation 19 here uh, where we have uh, the, uh, the marriage of the lamb. There's a ceremony. It'll be a, like, a, like a mimicking a wedding ceremony. Christ is the bridegroom. The church made up of all these millions of believers through from Pentecost to the rapture. They are the bride of Christ in a relationship. And give glory to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Well, that's interesting. What do I got to do to get ready? We'll find out. Do I have to do anything? It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen. This got to be literal. Fine linen, the best of the category. Bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And uh, that starts with the salvation adjustment. So white as a color uh, illustrates the righteousness of God. White has always been symbolic of that which is pure and proper. Okay. Post-trib rapture, the church goes through all the trib. This, this view, again, is refuted by what I just referred to. So we'll move on from the, the stupid views of the rapture. You knew inevitably there would be those who would say it. The church is specifically promised a pre-trib. That's before. Pre-millennial, before deliverance. Revelation 3.10. which I have written out here. To the church at Philadelphia, this was the sixth church in the series of seven churches to whom uh, the message to the seven churches is given here in Revelation uh, chapters two, <clears throat> two and three. The, the one of the churches that received no condemnation was the church, yeah, that's it, Philadelphia. You know, like, you know, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The, the word Philadelphia in the Greek means brotherly love. 
And this church was in the town of Philadelphia where all these churches existed in relative proximity to one another, the seven churches of Asia. These seven churches were picked because they illustrate seven phases or eras of the church age from the apostolic church at Ephesus to the last one, the rapture generation church, La Laodicea. I was reading an article, or I was reading some stuff, uh, they, they, they found, uh, quite by accident, uh, they found a, uh, a broken statue uh, of the Emperor Trajan, I think. It was busted up. And they put it all back together and stood it back up. It was standing in Laodicea, that statue. But the article went on to say, this town, city, was, and the population of it, very wealthy. Very much so. They're not condemned here in this thing for being wealthy. The general population exuded, of that church, exuded wealth, as did the general population outside the church. So this town was a booming, prosperous town. Okay? But the church at Philadelphia, and there's, in some Bibles, they, you have a little map that shows where they're all located relative to well, our modern country of Turkey. And like I said, you know, if they had highways and cars back then, you could, you could, you could tour them pretty readily. So they weren't that far apart. These seven churches, there were still churches all over the place, Rome and all these other places at that time. But these seven churches were, were chosen because they illustrate certain things. And uh, the church at Philadelphia gets nothing but positive review, uh, 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 evaluation from Christ. So it came from the Lord to the apostle John. And he said, he had a lot of work to do. He had to write this so everybody got a copy of Revelation. I, I imagine he had to have some help. Sit down sometime and try to just copy uh, in, in English this whole book. Looking it down and writing it on a piece of paper. Of course, you've got a computer and you can, do, you can type. But still, imagine back then when they had to do everything in pen and ink. And so each of these churches received, received the whole book each of these churches had a spiritual leader because we're moving to, we're, right, we're, at the, we're, at the, we're at the dead end of the apostolic era when it's, uh, uh, we're going to transition into these, these different eras. I lost my train of thought a second. Pardon me. Uh, and so, okay, back to Philadelphia. And, and each of the churches... John is given this commission and to the messenger of the church in Philadelphia, write. It isn't an angel, a spirit being. That's the translation, angelos, which is basic core meaning means a messenger and is, is a term was used for the angels. To, and so the messenger would be the pastor teacher of the church in Philadelphia, write. And in each of these instances, Christ is presented to the church as his credentials. His, his credentials are vast. Regarding his credentials, he who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David. What's the key of David? It's the, it's the, it's the Davidic covenant where God promised to David that he would have an heir that would sit on his throne and rule forever. It would come from his body and, and, this, and the sons and the grandsons and all the way down to the birth of Christ. He holds the key of David. And he was promised that he would be a world ruler, not just a ruler over Israel, but a world ruler who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut. If he opens a door and he doesn't want it closed, it won't be shut. And who shuts and no one opens. 
He's the Lord of history. This, this applies right down to the individual life, life of nations, life of people, life of church, what, whatever. And in each case, the evaluation is, I know your deeds. I know, I know your applications of doctrine. I know these. Behold, I have put before you an open door. Does this, does this refer to some outreach ministry of evangelism? An open door, uh, which no one can shut. You're going to carry on in your ministry, and no one is going to shut you down. And considering the fact that you don't have very much strength in the human realm, money, whatever, I'm opening a door no one can shut. And uh, because you have a little power, this refers to their, nat their natural resources, not their spiritual side. It's their material side. And have kept my word. You haven't, you, haven't, you haven't caved in under duress. And unlike the church at Laodicea, the saints at Philadelphia were the lower end of the economic ladder. You kept my word and have not denied my name. In the face, which implies that you've done this in the face of persecution and opposition. Now here's an interesting one. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan. Synagogue of Satan. He's not referring to a Jewish synagogue. He is referring to some secret society or some outfit like the Masons. You know, it's got all their little secrets and their little handshakes and their little stuff they do, all this stuff. You know, the modern Masons have three, 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 they have the, they have the, uh, with, they have the Bible, the Koran, and what's the other one? And they're all out there on a table, you know, and their uniforms and the different levels, working up the ladder. It's something like that. Because he says, Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews. You may not have ever heard of the Khazarian Mafia. They hold sway in Ukraine. They have been around. They're pretender Jews. This is this is something that can be documented. And when it started, they were pagans, and they came out, and they did Jewish practices, and they claimed to be Jews, but they didn't have the genetics. They're Gentiles parading around as Jews. <laughs> Who say they are Jews and are not. You wouldn't say that about any Jew. That's a, those people over there, whether they're liberals, secular, strict Jews, rabbis, blah, 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 they're Jews. I, was, I, I just got a thing on my phone this morning. Uh, it's, it's a site called Israel in the News. And there's an article about worldwide Jews. And it's a pretty good article. It, it, it's talking about the Jews and the percentage. It, okay. The thing says that, uh, I'm just repeating this, it says there's something between 15 and 17 million Jews in the world, and again they said, most in America. Then they were going on to break it down and say, how many of those? Because today, on into tomorrow, whatever the exact hours of the day are, the Jews, the strict Jews, and even the ones that are not that strict, are celebrating the highest holy day, they say, of their calendar, Yom Kippur. Yom means day, and Kippur means atonement. And this is supposed to be the day where, this is the day when they ask God, they fast. It's a solemn day. You never say, happy Yom Kippur. It's supposed to be a down day in which you, uh, Israel had it every year, and, and, and all the past sins of the nation, they, they seek forgiveness for all of this, and get a new start, kind of. Well, we've got rebound. 
So we don't have to worry about it. But anyway, uh, the, the, the Yom Kippur, the Yom Kippur thing, uh, there are a, about all of the Jews in Israel that are currently involved with this. Like I said, there, there's no funville on this on, at this time. You, you can't do your usual fun stuff. You can't have marital relations. You can't, you can't party. You can't eat. Uh, you, you just fast. It's Day of Atonement. It was the most solemn day. Well, there is a percentage of Jews in Israel and out that believe that Jesus is the atonement. He's the real, he's the real thing. And belief in him, and this article started off with having your name in the book of life. They got things screwed up because they're into salvation by works. But there are, there, they say in this article, and I read it, uh, for some reason it wouldn't go over to my computer. It was all scrambled, all kind of. But I can't, uh, oh, I, my phone's in there. <laughs> uh, but I, but, but I, read, I read, through, read through the thing. And the biggest, and, and it deals with all the Jews through history and their calculations as to how many Jews in the world and then how many of them, what percentage are believers, actual believers in Christ? Well, of course, he, he said now the trend is that there's more and more of them coming to, coming to salvation through Christ. More and more. One of the things is because Jew would feel funny about going to an evangelical church. So they can just get online and see what all the arguments were that show that in their Old Testament, in the Old Testament, that the Messiah, Jesus, fits the bill for all this. And they can look at it for themselves. So that there is, there is a growing number of Jews in the world. And we know, well, we knew that uh, the thing that will spark this like crazy for the Jews turning to Christ will be the rapture. And that whole tribulation period, we'll see a conversion, not of all Jews, even if it's one-third Again, the article said most of the believing Jews who believe in Jesus are in the U.S. of A. And there's some in Israel and in other nations. <clears throat> we obviously have the highest, highest percentage per capita of believers probably on the earth. There are a lot of them in, in China, I understand. But uh, we have the highest percentage. A lot of good it's doing us because they're, 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 they're not positive and not acting like the salt of the earth. <clears throat> okay, on to this. Uh, he says, but lie. They're lying when they say they're Jews. So this is, a, this is a specific group. This is an unbelieving Jews in the city of Philadelphia giving Christians trouble, like they did other places at this time. It is fake Jews, Gentiles. And they call it today the Khazarian Mafia. I will make them come and bow down at your feet. Can you, when historically in a city would they ever come and bow down? Yeah, the Lord could physically take someone and shove their face in the ground. But that doesn't make any sense to me. This must be at the second advent when this Khazarian mafia and their descendants will be around and they will bow down if this is, if this is fulfilled at the second advent. That these, that these Christians in, in, that little, in that little impoverished city, town, they, they, they were being abused by these. The, the, I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I've loved you. These fake Jews. So is that, that's, that's an additional wrinkle at the second advent? When we will see the saints from Philadelphia that we read about right here? Those Christians back then that were doing it right? Because you've kept the word of my patience, I also will keep you, and this was the key verse here, I will also keep you from the hour of testing. The tribulation is viewed as an hour on your, from one hour out of a day. 
divide into two equal periods of 30 minutes. And so the trib is divided into two equal periods. So we study the first half events, what happens at the dead center point, and then working our way the last three and a half years to the second half. It's called that hour. And he says, which is about to come upon the whole world. It's waiting in the wings. Now I got more on that, which you know what it is already mostly, but why it couldn't happen in any old time. But we'll get to that. To test, to test those who dwell on the earth. What is he testing? Their volition. What are you going to do with this rapture event? All these unbelievers. What are you going to do with all these other things that are, that are transpiring? And then the judgments that fall. It's testing humanity. To test those who dwell on the earth. In other words, to see which way they'll jump. Get with God's plan or stay in unbelief. I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have so that no one will take your crown. Don't let anybody influence you away from what you've been doing so as to forfeit the crown, the high reward. I've tried to, I've tried to communicate this my whole ministry. Don't let anybody talk you out of your crown, which means put you on a different path, down a different road, away from sound doctrine. Don't let anybody do it. Was that, can, I, can I make that any clear? Well, what about if it was this person? It doesn't matter. It's another person that's trying to influence you to bail, go their way, whatever it is. So a lot of people have been influenced by somebody that, that took their crown, so to speak. Disqualified them. And then with each of the churches, there is a statement here of phase three blessing. He who overcomes, that's the salvation adjustment, not anything else in this case. He who overcomes, the believer, the worst believer, the bad believers, the failed believers, whatever you want to call them, the non-positive ones, and the good ones. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. What's a temple? What? All, all the big temples of antiquity had these pillars, you know, the, uh, uh, the Greek one, the Acropolis. Those darn things are still standing there. They've had to do some repair work on them, on the exterior of them, spruce them up. Well, those pillars they made back in the day, they made, they made to endure and stand the ravages of time. So a pillar and they had pillars in the, in, the, in the temples of Israel. These pillars, they're a permanent fixture. They're not going anywhere. I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He will not go out from it anymore. Is that a reference? Is this a reference to the new Jerusalem and the residency there? And I'll write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem. Of course, this, this, shoots, this shoots up past the millennium onto the new earth, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. New name? So we have a mystery. We have mysteries here. We don't know what that is. We'll have to wait and see. He who has an ear, your ear's working okay, maybe not as good as they did once before, but you got an ear, the ear gate. I would think if you are gonna rate your senses, if you were doing it from a doctrinal perspective, would you rather be able to see or hear if you had to pick one? So I want to rather see. I can do, I can do sign language. <laughs> okay, I understand that. But... I can't do sign language up here with doctrine if, you, if you're a deaf, if a person was deaf and came in here. You're gonna have to figure out a way around that. We never had that, we never had that issue. Uh, we've, had, we've, had, we've had to deal with the blind who sat there and learned, heard doctrine. 
So he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit, that's the revealer of truth, says to the churches. This information is for all these churches, even though this was a personalized letter for the church at Philadelphia. <clears throat> so, in this verse I cited here in this letter, he is not promising to protect them in the tribulation, which he could do. He's, he's promised to deliver them out from the tribulation, as well as the First Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.10, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who, who rescues, that's the word delivers, it's, in this case it's a different word, rule my, who delivers, who delivers us from the wrath to come, the orge to come. First Thessalonians 5, 9 again, for God has not destined us for the wrath, it's got the definite article in the Greek, but for obtaining a deliverance through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, Roman numeral 10, the timing of the rapture. My nemesis. <laughs> Jack Ballinger's nemesis. We'll see. The timing of the rapture. So uh, let's, let's take a break. <laughs> 